Introduction Some of the greatest conflicts in history occupy a very important center place in cultural and sociopolitical aspects. They are an anchor of inspiration to take from when it comes to resistance and upholding one's self-respect. Wars, just like anything else, are an integral ingredient of a functional civilization, for without it, human survival is itself an impossible task. In popular media, wars are shown to be the ideal event between good versus evil. Since that could be a case to record, wars have generally been fought for political and social purposes, at least in the real spectrum, and that concept really hasn't changed, at least since the time when humans started developing full-scale civilizations. True, wars involve violence, but even political purposes can be either good or bad. Take the case of the historical Third Servile War, where a gladiator named Spartacus rebelled against Roman rule in the southern parts of mainland Italy, with the objective of freeing all slaves from the Republic. As heroic it might suggest, and heroic it indeed was among the gladiators, the Third Servile War had political repercussions not just under Roman rule, but for the next millennium as well, most notably during the Great War of 1937-45, to when several eastern countries under the Soviet regime used his inspiration against the invading hordes of Nazis. In addition, the slaves under Spartacus also wanted to form up their own nation-state, as a lot of popular historians suggest. And yet, certain conflicts are purely political in nature. During the same era, and some centuries following the Servile War, Julius Caesar would annex the whole of Gaul to make it a proper Roman province. What were the reasons behind such a stand? Several speculations exist, but the clear facts tells us that Rome had ambitions in its northern neighbouring regions as well for the civilization to really spread to the rest of Europe. In addition, Gallic tribes were seen as a constant threat to the Italian peninsula, and quite some of them had even indulged in free raiding of northern territories of Rome, leading to occasional damage to economic and human life. The political and social repercussions of Roman expansion were enormous and permanent. In Europe, specifically in the western portion of it, that encompasses nations like Britain, France, Iberian Peninsula, and of course Italy and its islands, political setups right from the level of magistrates to the establishment of political parties and working democratic organizations, including the legal system, all pretty much still relate to the organizational structure laid down by the Greeks and Romans and have their origins in them alone. This could never be achieved if political expansions were not realized, and hence, senators, administrators, and generals made it sure that civilization really pushed the human race forward. In this compilation, some of the leading historical conflicts have been described that have their repercussions still felt today, surrounding us everywhere. These include conflicts like the Second World War, the First World War, American Civil War, the Napoleonic era, and many more, with some of these great conflicts not having the space to be described below. Chapter 1 The Second World War Undoubtedly, the greatest wars have been fought in the 20th century. With rapid advancements in weapon technologies, the scale and range of the battlefield dramatically changed for the first time, at least since the start of World War I. Now, wars were not just being fought alone by soldiers and generals and those holding responsibility on the battlefield, but also by civilians, vigilants and independent groups. The introduction of gunpowder itself had changed the course of human history forever. Now, it was to be seen on a global scale. The Second World War is also undoubtedly the greatest global conflict in all of human history. Official dates of its beginnings differ, but most agree that the conflict started in 1937 with the election of Hitler as the Chancellor of Germany and his party as the leading faction of the nation and the events that followed thereafter. <laughs> 
The war only reached its peak starting from 1939 to 1940 with the final declaration of the US in the war and the surprise invasion of Soviet Union, thus leading to an era where giants like Russia participated at full lengths. It was an era of total war. These course of events were not just limited to the European theatre. A new rising power, Imperial Japan, had risen to new, unprecedented political levels never before seen in Japanese history. After the unification of Japan in the Middle Ages and a series of efficient policies and enterprising statesmanship, the island nation had become the powerhouse of the Eastern Sphere, surrounded by incomparably weak and obscure nation-states to its immediate west. China was extremely divided and embroiled in one civil war after another following the collapse of the Qing regime in early 1900s, and with little to no resolve. The once huge civilization lay almost open to Japanese intervention and its ever-increasing political clout and influence. To some, the sudden Japanese participation in the war was a drastic hasty step. Imperial Japan had reached increasing heights post-1850s after the Meiji Restoration in 1868. Japan's rapid industrialization and militarization later in the early decades of 1900s made the country pinnacle power in the Southeast Asian sphere and it had political ambitions beyond the island nation. In its early phases during the First World War, Japan, although remaining neutral, supported the Allied side and thereby supplied troops and equipment primarily to the UK. However, during the 1930s, Japanese interventions in several events pertaining to this Southeast Asian region and bordering Soviet Russia was putting the US at least in a doubtful mode. The Japanese had earlier contested with the Russians to take control of the latter's easternmost provinces and were already at an alarming phase with China. The US was becoming increasingly wary of Japanese since it had several fleets in the region. It does not need to be noted that Japanese intervention during the Second World War is still considered to be a very controversial act on the part of the imperial government. Several secret correspondence does seem to exist between the Nazis and Japanese, with the latter's governmental circles even prompting to avoid the war with the US, as it would prove devastating for the country. The US had, however, put certain economic embargoes, specifically on oil, that the Japanese thought it to be unacceptable. Finally, on 7th of December, 1941, the Japanese retorted to an undeclared assault on Pearl Harbor, resulting in the deaths of hundreds of American personnel. Franklin Roosevelt, in the next one day, would declare war on the Japanese, and the latter would take sides with the Axis. The Second World War involved great losses to human life, as well some of the most dynamic and permanent changes in international borders never before observed in human history. Its toll on millions and the independence of several Asian, African and Latin American nations from erstwhile colonial powers was a landmark in human history, not to forget the formation of a new international order governed by organisations such as NATO, the United Nations and the Bretton Woods Conference that would lead to a number of new economic organisations as well. All in all, around 40 million to 75 million approximate dead are estimated at the end of the war, 1945. These include civilian as well as military casualties, the highest ever recorded from a conflict. The end of the Second World War led to a number of new nations and superpowers that would decide the course of events for the next six decades. The total dissolution of the Empire of Britain, transformation of Imperial Japan to a democratic republic and the division of Germany into Eastern and Western blocs, aided by the rise of America and Soviet Union as the two leading powers of the world, were its greatest aftermath. This era would also bring in a new kind of conflict, popularly known as the Cold War between two former allies, US and the Soviets. A number of Asian and African nations gained independence during this time, including the now emerging powers of India, South Africa, notable Southeast Asian powers like Malaysia and Indonesia, Philippines and Vietnam, and developed economies like Singapore and Taiping.
almost the whole of colonial Africa would become fully decolonized within the next 30 years. Chapter 2 The First World War Preceding the era of the Second World War, the next in list of history's greatest conflicts is World War I, also known as the First World War. The Great Wars have much similarity between them. Both wars were fought by common nations that only differed in governmental setups in the early 1900s during the onset of the conflict. The First World War was fought between the Allied Powers of United Kingdom and its allies versus the Central Powers of Imperial Germany, Austria-Hungary and, then, and the then fading Ottoman Empire. The onset of the 20th century was a turbulent and dynamic era in European politics. The Bolsheviks, under the leadership of Lenin and fellow communists, had overthrown the age of Tsarist regime of Russia and established a new Soviet Union. In the West, Germany during this time was being headed by a monarch, and hence called Imperial Germany, that had lost a lot of its political and economic strength. Its fellow German ally, Austria-Hungary, also sought to regain its lost classical era. To the south, and the most notable, once powerful Ottoman Sultanate had become only a shell or a shadow of its former self. With almost all of its Middle Eastern, Eurasian and Balkan territories lost, the Sultan actively looked forward to the day when the Turks would regain their former economic and national glory. Although the conflict remained predominantly European in its engagement, its combatants involved global adversaries, with only a certain portion of Southeast Asia, Japan and China, being set aside, almost the rest of Asia and Africa was directly or indirectly involved in the Great War, owing much to the historical perspective since this was also a peak colonial era. Major combatants involved the UK, France, Germany, Austria-Hungary and the Ottoman Empire. Together these powers covered almost half of the known world. The newly formed Soviet Russia would remain neutral throughout, although it would by itself plan ahead for a more active participation in European politics. In the East, Japan would remain reluctantly neutral, although the to-be major power in the Second World War would supply equipment and aid to the Allied powers, specifically to the UK. The First World War is often termed as a foolish war by modern historians, citing many reasons that may be in support of the claim. In fact, the whole course of events that led to the global crisis that would claim an approximate 3.8 million lives are still seen through shock since these events turned into a global conflict within not more than two months. On 28th of June 1914, the Archduke, an heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary, Franz Ferdinand, got assassinated from a Serbian nationalist. The Archduke had missed assassination attempts by six Serbian nationalists who had assembled in Vienna during his visit to the city. Coincidentally, the convoy of the Archduke took a wrong turn to a street where another assassin was located, unknowing that the convoy would take a turn to the street. Gavrilo Princip, another Serbian nationalist and intended assassin, stood nearby where the convoy was passing from. Gavrilo, waiting for the right movement, captured the opportunity and shot the Archduke and his wife from point-blank range while the convoy was still passing forward. Amidst the chaos, surrounding guards were able to arrest Gavrilo almost instantly, although speculative theories exist as to how the assassin was brought forward to authorities owing to lack of substantial witnesses that could relate to the arrest of the assassin. What started as a movement to establish a free and independent Serbia soon turned out to be the little spark that would put almost half of the known globe into total conflict. The days following the assassination attempt were marked by an uncanny normalcy. Streets of Vienna seemed absolutely undisturbed and pretty much the same as they used to be before with little change in day-to-day -day life. Even among political circles of Austria, only a certain shock was observed, but the chances of a full-scale war was being totally ignored until the month of July, also known as the July Crisis. Following the assassination attempt in June, a whole list of political events revealed themselves in the following month. 
since Serbia was at the centre of Europe, that is, a territory that included a number of communities, most notably being German-speaking as well as Slavic, the small nation was being keenly watched by Austria, the newly formed USSR to the east, and even Ottomans to the south, who had ruled the nation for several decades, at least during their peak of power in the Middle Ages. However, a trifling Austrian affair would turn out into a global conflict is still seen through with all by most historians and political analysts. In the next couple of years that followed, Europe turned into a mosh pit of a wrestling ground. The month of July oversaw some hasty and tiring diplomatic exchanges between European powers as France was warned by Germany not to support the general mobilisation of Russia and Serbia, while several Allied powers demanded immediate referendums and actions towards mobilisation. Austria even issued certain diplomatic demands to Serbians in return for independence, although these demands were deliberately designed for Serbia to reject them as a bait to an armed conflict where Austria could take control over the region once and for all. The years from 1914 to 1918 were thus seen as one of the deadliest in the course of all human history. Massive mobilization of armies took place and some of the most gruelling events happened in around Belgium and borders of France where thousands of miles of dug trenches, still in existence today as part of active tourist spots, served as the resting place for soldiers, as well as their place of demise. More than 40 million people died during this short period of conflict, one of the highest ever, with a male population being seriously at threat in Europe as battle lines neither shifted nor moved any further away from the current establishment. World War I was thus a total stalemate, although the Allied powers came out victorious, with such costs that permanently affected everything. And yet, the Great War instilled in such long-lasting repercussion not observed centuries before the war. The year of 1918 saw the official dissolution of some of the largest powers in Europe forever. Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire and Imperial Germany were forever dissolved with all of the territories controlled by these powers being resulting into several nations. Serbia was henceforth declared an independent constitutional monarchy officially on 1st of December 1918. Chapter 3 American Civil War The American Civil War was fought between 1861 to 1865. Although only a short, five-year conflict, it witnessed one of the greatest conflicts in all of American history, and perhaps in the industrialized world of the mid-1800s. The war is often categorized as the bloodiest in U.S. history, and was so great that it recorded a much higher number of military casualties than those observed in World War I and World War II combined. More than 750,000 American soldiers died due to full-scale conventional war and the disease that followed thereafter. These figures include both Confederate as well as Union casualties. The causes of the Great Civil War were purely socio-political in nature and revolved primarily around the issue of slavery in Northern America. By the late 1800s, a very considerable portion of Africans had settled in these territories during the time when the states were being newly formed and Africans were traded extensively in both South as well Northern American territories. So immense was the phenomenon of slave trade in the 1700s that a considerable portion of the American economy was being operated by them. Africans during this time compromised the primary labour resource on plantations and agriculture estates, mostly owned by whites, but worked by Africans. Also so immense was the contribution from African Americans that literally the whole southern territory of the US, including seven states, thought slavery to be an integral part of their economy, state rights and society. Anti-slavery movements and policy actions across the U.S. during this time were seen as violating of the rights of southern plantation owners and agriculturists, some even believing in the laziness of blacks in a free labour market. The whole notion of the dependency of the southern economy on black labourers was the prime catalyst of the conflict that ensued in these five years. <laughs> 
In 1860, America prepared to elect its 16th president. Abraham Lincoln, one of the greatest considered presidents and ranked among the top three by most contemporary as well as modern historians and political analysts, held sway over the northern states where he won by a decisive wave. Abraham Lincoln was also to become the nation's first ever Republican president. In the aftermath of the 1860 election that followed in seven of these southern states, where he hardly won any representation, declared themselves seceded from the federal government. In one sense, these states had cleared themselves to be independent of the rest of the nation, even rebelling, as certain authors and historians point out. The secession had obvious preceding events. Almost the whole South had threatened the federal government of a full secession if Abraham Lincoln was to be elected as the president, and hence his almost negligible vote in these areas. When in 1861 Lincoln was successfully elected to the White House, the South, politically enraged by the event, declared themselves independent and officially formed the Confederate States of America, popularly known as the Confederacy, headed by Jefferson Davis as their president. The Confederacy was such that no foreign country really recognized its diplomacy and hence a total lack of intervention from such countries that imported American cotton, especially certain major powers of Europe like Britain, which the Confederacy thought it would intervene in favor of the Confederacy. None did, however, and the vague promise got further jeopardized by Lincoln's attempt to thwart any assistance being provided to the South by blockading and destroying southern ports that could prove to be a potential element in trading arms, ammunition and even cotton from Europe. With any prospective support from Europe now forever gone, the South took to its determined path to capture Washington, D.C., the Civil War was one of the first ever industrial wars, that is, mass mobilization of men and resources ever to be first observed in modern history. Both the Union as well as South were equally matched in terms of ability, number of men and quality of leaders. In fact, the South gained immensely during the first phases of the war and Lincoln had to devote considerable time in strategizing and executing military decisions he hardly ever had any experience in. In spite of the limitations of a lack of proper military education faced by him, Lincoln threw referring manuals, books and any amount of literature that he could get his hand on, implemented some of the finest and best decisions lauded even in today's time. Abraham Lincoln cut off the South's trade route by destroying some of their key important ports, since the South never had a seizable navy. Next, Lincoln personally supervised all his appointment of top generals and military personnel. He maintained calmness under such events when the Union was in some instances unable to capture the Confederate capital. In such instances, Lincoln would quickly reshuffle the command and resume the war momentum. In addition to executing some key naval decisions, Lincoln also personally took command of the standing army by appointing his most successful general, Ulysses S. Grant, as the chief of the army. The latter would become the next president of the U.S. after Lincoln's sudden assassination in 1865. The Civil War raged on, equally matched with much ferocity around central U.S., surrounding the areas of Richmond and Virginia, and finally climaxing at Gettysburg, the resting place where the future of the U.S. was set. In the early summer days of July 1863, the Battle of Gettysburg continued for three days, finally concluding on 3rd of July, with the utter decimation of Confederate Army under the command of Robert E. Lee. With the strength of the South now completely extinguished, Lee finally surrendered to the Union and agreed upon surrendering everything that related to the Confederate States and that the rebelled states were now a part of the Union government. Certain skirmishes dotted the Southern territories, but the war had been won and Richmond had been captured following the Battle of Five Forks, where General Lee made his last stand to make some gain from the remaining Confederate army. The Great Civil War was such that it would leave a permanent imprint on American society for the rest of the periods that followed.
the assassination of the 16th president of the U.S. would make him one of the greatest presidents of the U.S. and a martyr. The Civil War was also a start of the Reconstruction era, whereby the end of it would be characterized by extensive rebuilding and developmental measures that would last almost till the start of the 1900s. The greatest contribution of the Civil War, however, the emancipation of the millions of black citizens who toiled under hard conditions, working extensively without any recognition at all. The Emancipation Act would symbolize the historic step of the assimilation of all communities that existed in the U.S. and the century that would follow. Chapter 4 The Napoleonic Era The Napoleonic Wars were one of the most important events in modern European history. Many scholars suggest lack of it could never have resulted in the independence of so many small nations, especially in the Balkans, if someone like Napoleon could have never have risen to the French throne. The Napoleonic Wars, also popularly known as the Napoleonic Era, was a set of military conflicts dating from 1803 with the declaration of Napoleon I as the Emperor of the French Empire till its dissolution and the reverting back of the Bourbon family to the French crown in 1815 following the defeat of the French at Waterloo and the exile of Napoleon Bonaparte. The Napoleonic era was perhaps one of the first events that would categorize itself as a global conflict, although its global scale really referred to the French conflict with the Ottomans, specifically in northern Africa, where the former controlled vast swathes of territories till the Middle East, all the way to the edge of erstwhile Kingdom of Morocco. The era remained, however, purely European in scale and historiography. Its repercussions were permanent and were felt overseas on several regions of Latin America that would be discussed later in the chapter. The Napoleonic era was one of the most turbulent in modern European history, following what the two great world wars stood for. It would also count to one of the highest ever casualties recorded in early 19th century European events. The beginning of the Napoleonic era starts with the reign of Napoleon Bonaparte, following the arrest and execution of King Louis XIV in the French Revolution. In 1789, France was characterized as being involved in a number of political conflicts with its neighboring powers, most notably Britain, Prussia and Austria. To its easternmost corner, Russia too played its part indirectly. During the late half of the 18th century, France had weakened substantially for other major powers to gain strides in the global spectrum. With several of its colonies lost, France actually got confined to nothing more than its European borders. This was also the time when the nation transformed itself into republic from monarchical rule following the ouster of the ruling king. It was also during the late 18th century when a young general named Napoleon Bonaparte would rise to become ruler of France and emperor of his own carved imperial domain that pretty much imitated the erstwhile Western Roman Empire. So extensive Napoleon's achievements were that quite a lot of French polity seen today got established by him, including legal codes and the French flag itself with the official motto. However, all this came at a great cost and an epic episode in European history. The initiation of the Napoleonic Wars is subjected to debate by several authors and historians. Most, although, agree that the French Revolution be included in the Napoleonic era since Bonaparte was a fully commissioned general by then and earned great victories at Egypt and northern Italy against rising Austria. However, the peak of the war began never before 1803, during the invasion of Italy and the Iberian Peninsula, and the decisive defeat of Austria resulting in the Treaty of Pressburg that resulted in a total withdrawal of Austria from the war. From 1803 to 1806, France, under Napoleon, controlled a vast swathe of territory never achieved in French history before, even during the peak time of the Bourbons. In a single, swift motion, Napoleon was able to take in Western Germany, Netherlands, Belgium, Switzerland, Northern Italy, all the way to interior Austria's fully administered provinces of France. 
By that time, Napoleon's control over the French Republic and his military was triumphant and unstoppable. In fact, most historians agree that the position Napoleon was in 1806 was more than enough to sue for peace with Great Britain, Russia and all the major members of the First Coalition. However, France continued on without making major concessions, and this would prove to be a deadly mistake in the end. By 1806, Prussia and Russia had become the prime members of the Second Coalition, but in its fullest strength was still unable to stop French interests. The British were already involved with Napoleon, but fearing a destruction to their colonies, never really risked an all-out military campaign against France and its triumphant armies. Instead, it relied on a more unconventional warfare by inflicting hit-and-run tactics, especially on French trade routes and fleets, wherever it could get its hands on. Through such events, Britain was at least able to prevent the French on gaining any foothold on its colonies, including India, that Napoleon had seriously considered in his roadmap. He had even sought to send envoys to Indian rulers like Tipu Sultan to make alliance with him against British interests in the subcontinent. However, such long-term plans could never really be realised since Napoleon's energy and resources limited themselves to nowhere beyond Europe. At the turn of the dissolution of the Second Coalition, France had taken Berlin and severely defeated Russian armies. The French Empire had now achieved its greatest height, with the French flag waving triumphantly almost across the length and breadth of Western Europe. It had also inflicted some heavy blows to the Ottomans' hold on the Balkans and North Africa, following the era where the Sultanate was unable to progress itself due to several inbuilt socio-political limitations, especially from the clergy and imams who never allowed the ruler to implement in modern reforms for Turkish interest. The result was an almost total hegemony of France and its revolutionary spirit. However, all the glory was very short-lived and it was to end unexpectedly and really quickly. By the start of the Sixth Coalition, France had suffered greatly and all this came very unexpectedly. The invasion of Russia following some decisive victories for the French, especially on fields like Borodino, earned them great achievements that were to be short-lived. Following victories at Poland and the steppes, French gains severally thwarted during the invasion of Russia. The French had even occupied Moscow, but resistance still needed to be dealt with. Russia was by far the largest nation Napoleon had ever faced, and came face to face with the greatest difficulty to be ever handled, to gain foothold on every district and region of Russia during the time of peak winter when even the trees get frozen. The once triumphant French armies faced a very uncanny enemy now, nature's bizards and snowstorms that could never be destroyed with gunfire or a close combat, as the stinging breezes of the December Russian winter took soldier after soldier with it, Napoleon had to desperately sound the withdrawal call. One of the greatest ever attritions suffered by any army, the French got reduced to mere numbers with some of the ablest personnel under Napoleon gone with the winds. The invasion of Russia proved to be a total disaster, as more disasters lay ahead. Till the end of the Sixth Coalition, French armies suffered defeats for the first time in their service under Napoleon after winning decisive victories during the initial phases. Napoleon was now being outnumbered, and this was the most plausible reason of facing defeats. After the withdrawal at Lutzen, Napoleon had to now command on the fields of France itself, where heavily outnumbered French armies were unable to sustain themselves for long. Napoleon finally abdicated on 6th of April, 1814, and exiled to the island of Elba. For quite some time, the future of Europe was now set, although the now ebullient allies were facing an unexpected surprise. In 1815, Napoleon left his exiled home to command France again. He surprisingly took control over French affairs in a swift motion that caught off guard the allies who were now at peace and the borders of Europe redrawn to their default status. The Bourbon king was again deposed and Napoleon declared ruler. 
However, the year of 1815 was exceptionally short-lived, as the French dictator would witness his last days here. Following the formation of the Seventh Coalition, Britain with its allies of Europe decisively defeated the French army and Napoleon on the historic battlefield of Waterloo, permanently sealing the deal once and for all. Napoleon would never go on to see Paris again, instead being forced to exile to the remote island of St. Helena, west of the African western coast of Namibia on South Atlantic, thousands of miles away from Europe, where he would die six years later. The repercussions of the Napoleonic era were permanent. Following the occupation of Madrid and the fall of Imperial Spain to the hands of French, Spanish foothold on South America fell with its falling regime. Several of the former Spanish colonies became independent, with Portugal losing almost all of its possessions in the Amazonian continent. In Europe, the effect was far less. The principles of liberty and freedom were forever born, and these were to serve as leading principles for decades to come, even during the First World War, when several Balkan and Middle Eastern nations achieved independence from their former imperial rulers. Modern-day boundaries within Europe are actually the officially set boundaries of Congress of Vienna that took place in 1815 following the defeat of the French of Waterloo. Much of modern Europe owes its place to the Napoleonic era. Conclusion with the book now ending its content, the conclusion that follows is that human civilization is pretty much shaped by conflict and resolution. It is still being shaped by it, as can be seen in the Middle East and Eastern Europe. In several parts of Asia, borders are still being redrawn and history is being made. Conflict is thus an inherent part of society and no community gets shaped without it. However, as wars become more and more large-scaled with technology leading its frontiers, more rules and regulations need to be at place to legalize conflict and limit its reach so as to keep civilian life away from it. As that is a very difficult task to accomplish, it will take more resources and policy initiatives on the part of governments to tackle conflicts in more innovative and tactile manners as possible.